This is the uh, Chapter 12 lecture for Microbiology 230. I am Dr. McGraw. In this chapter, what we're looking at is we're going to look at the eukaryotic members of the microbial world. We're going to kind of take a look at all those variations uh, in, in the different types of organisms that are have eukaryotic uh, makeups or structure uh, in their cell cellular uh, formation, if you will. So a glimpse of history in the Irish potato famine, 1845-1847, which really caused an influx of Irish immigrants into the United States. The water mold, Phytophotoria, uh, infested and uh, disseminated the crop. It basically made large potatoes very small. Estimated 1.5 million died during that famine from starvation. And more than a million actually immigrated to the U.S. and Canada, so it was a very large immigration. The population of Ireland dropped by one-fourth, 25%. And it, and it showed the danger, um, historically, of relying on a single food source. Potatoes were the mainstay of most of the diets for the, uh, the poor Irish in Ireland. Potatoes brought to Europe 200 years earlier were from South Africa. They were easy to grow and nearly a complete food source. But the potato blight resulted in nearly $10 billion a year in losses until 2009. The genomes of potato and pea investments were sequenced in such a way to try to um, try to uh, prevent, if you will, the um, the um, them from doing that again. Now, microscopy. Uh, when you look at eukaryotes, there are informal groups of my, micro, microscopic eukaryotes. There's algae, and they're simple autotrophs. They are photosynthesizers. There's fungi or fungi. You can say it both ways, which are heterotrophic organisms. They have chitin in their cell wall, as opposed to petrical glycan. Protozoa, which are microscopic heterotrophs that are not fungi, and then proteins, which are eukaryotes that are not fungi, plants, or animals. And these are multicellular organisms like worms and certain arthropods that are involved in disease, and they're often transmitted or carried, carried in microscopic form. So, kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking at or how we, how we uh, or what we're trying to approach in this, this particular lecture. The eukaryotes different from prokaryotes, as just a reminder, is that they have a nucleus. Remember, prokaryotes have no nucleus, they have a nucleoid. And it's a member-bound organelle, so all their, a lot of their mitochondria and their things like that are, are membrane-bound. There's no peptical glycan in the walls, and they usually have a pretty well-developed cytoskeleton. Now, they can be haploid or diploid, and what that means is they can have a full complement of their, um, of their, um, uh, of their of their genes, if you will, or their DNA, or they can have half a complement. So in other words, let me put it this way. So we, our, our um, uh, cells, our regular normal cells are 46 chromosome cells. And when we, are, we produce uh, sperm or eggs, they are 23 chromosome cells. The 46 chromosome cells are considered to be diploid. The ones that are 23 chromosome cells are considered to be haploid. So that gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Now, they also have asexual reproduction via mitosis and sexual reproduction via meiosis. Now, I'll explain that in just a bit. The diploid cells produce haploid cells, and it, again, they can be broken down to produce those half, si half cells, which will be the sexual cells. So the female and male uh, 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 organisms uh, produce these haploid cells, which will then be joined and uh, become a new organism. They can develop into haploid organisms or gametes, sex cells, and the fusion of two gametes yields a diploid cell and the recombination of the genetic material. That's just a mechanism that's used, and some of these do both. Some of them do sexual and asexual reproduction as part of their normal process. They go through one and the other, one and the other. Fungi includes molds and yeasts and mushrooms, and it refers to morphological forms. It's not really a classification. Yeasts are single-celled fungi. Molds are filamentous fungi. And mushrooms are reproductive structures of certain fungi. And in mycology, it is the, the, the term mycology is really a study of mushrooms. Just to let you know, so you get an idea of the different kind of organisms we're talking about. Now, the cell wall of fungi contains chitin as opposed to peptidyl glycan in our prokaryotes. The fungal membranes typically have a content called ergosterol, and the fungi excrete enzymes to degrade larger molecules. So they break down larger molecules. They degrade uh, larger molecules. Along with bacteria, they are one of our principal decomposers. They can degrade cellulose and lignin, which is wood. And it releases CO2, nitrogen compounds in the soil, so it's good for uh, increasing the nitrogen in the soil. And they're saprophytic, which means the nutrients from the dead or decaying matter uh, are, uh, um, are utilized. Some act as parasites of living tissue, few infect humans, plant infections are common. Some fungi form a symbiotic relationship, uh, for example, lichens, we'll talk about those in a little bit. 
Classification of fungi is really still in flux, as, as most of the taxonomy for most of our microbiological organisms. There's about 100,000 recognized species, uh, likely over about a million total. And that, so the chapter 12 really consists only of four major groups. And that four major groups include the uh, uh, Cotridiomyces, uh, Zygomycetes, Acido, uh, Ascomycetes, and Abacidiomycetes. So that's the four major groups we'll kind of talk about uh, as far as fungi is concerned. Now, uh, chytrids, if you will, are usually live in water. Some in mammalian gut, some are parasitic, like um, uh, uh, Batrachio catrigium, like is it, uh, Dendrobatidius, which infects frogs. It's interesting. Uh, only fungi with modal forms are, are, have reproductive cells. Zygomycetes include black red mold, a rhizopus is called, and reproductive structures are called sporang sporangia. Now, Acetomycetes. Or Ascomycetes is a sac fungi, which includes 75% of all the known fungi. For instance, penicillin is an Ascomycetes. And uh, it, it can also be pathogens, morels, and truffle. Um, truffles are part of that, as well as lichens. Acidiomycetes is a, called a club fungi. It includes mushrooms and plant parasites like smuts and rust. You'll hear about that. The structure of fungi, most fungi is multicellular, composed of hyphae. Its visible mass of hyphae is called mycelium. So the mycelium looks like little stems of the of what we're looking at. The spore is like the the uh, the round part. It looks like the egg, if you want to think of it that way. The tip of the hyphae grows rapidly in the direction of the food source. And so it, it grows throughout the food. Opening remains uh, between the cells, allowing movement along the hyphae, so what we're saying. High surface to volume ratio aids in nutrient absorption. So they, uh, they create a lot of uh, surface area so they can absorb lots of nutrients. Now, fungi are the most successful in moist environments, and some have very specialized hyphae. Parasitic fungi, haustoria, protrude into host cells. Uh, saprophytic fungi, or like rhizoids, may anchor to the substrate they're, being, they're getting their nutrients from. Dimorphic fungi can grow as single yeast cells or multicellular mycelia, so they can grow in two different ways. For example, histoplasma capsulatum mold in soil is one of those examples of dimorphic fungi. Now, reproductive spores uh, are re easily airborne. That's what their job is, is to spread out and, and let, the, let the organism uh, spread its, its uh, progeny and so it can grow in different locations. They develop into yeast form when inhaled, and they can cause disease. There are several versions of that. Now, fungal habitats are mostly terrestrial. They're found in nearly every habitat in the Earth, including thermal pools, volcanic craters, and high salt environments. Some are widespread, others grow only on a specific plant. Some fungi can degrade many compounds. Even some can, do, some can degrade uh, certain plastics. They grow in concentrations of salt, sugars, acids, alkalis that would kill most other bacteria. Most prefer to live in 20 centigrade to 35 centigrade uh, environment, but are easily, can easily survive at lower temperatures. Some grow actually below the freezing point. Now, they spoil pickles and fruit preserves and refrigerated refrigerate food. Most of the fungi are aerobic. Some yeasts are facultative anaerobes. And some obligate anaerobes live, live, anaerobes live in, the, in the lumen. That should be lumen, not rumen, of cows. Now, fungi have symbiotic relationships. For instance, lichens uh, are association of fungus and a photosynthesizer, algae or cyanobacterium. And so fungus prod, project, I'm sorry, fungus protects, absorbs water and nutrients. So this combination helps protect all that. It allows growth in ecosystems where neither could alone survive. So these, this algae or cyanobacterium, uh, if you will, uh, combined with this fungus and allows that them to grow or maybe the, the environment would be obstructive for growth of either, either one of them alone. And so, for example, the subarctic tundra, they grow in bare rock, uh, which is kind of interesting when you think that the ability to grow in that, that cold. Now, uh, mycorrhizas are beneficially associated with plant roots. They have a high surface area of hyphae and it supplies plant with water, minerals, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So they have a positive aspect on our food supply. The plant supplies fungi with organic compounds. And estimated that 80% of vascular plants have mycorrhizas involved in them. Plants grow better with some orchids require mycorrhiza, for instance. It's just interesting. They require it. It helps to sub, uh, provide substance for them or sustenance. Now, certain insects also de de depend on these fungi. For instance, uh, leaf-cutting ants uh, farm fungal gardens. And ants cannot eat often poisonous uh, tropical vegetation. So instead, they chop the plants into pieces, they add the mycelium, the fungus grows and digests the plant's material, 
and they produce a they produce these reproductive structures that are then eaten by the ant. So the ant uses the the, the leaves they can't eat; it would kill them for um, for a as a growth medium to grow some more of the, the fungi. Now, in reproduction in fungi, the structures are important in identification. The spores, the reproductive cells, are formed sexually or asexually and carried by wind or water. Asexual spores are called canida, canidia, sorry, or sporangiospores in zygomycetes. Housed in structures, sporangia, zygomycetes, or ASCII, ascomycetes, or in basidiomycetes beneath the mushroom or the puffball. So there's the hyphae, there's the gills, the mushroom we're looking at. Um, you see the mycelium uh, down below. Now spores germinate and they grow hyphae. So here is a spore. This is the sexual. This is the growth uh, uh, portion of the vegetative portion of the plant. And the reduction results from fusion of hyphae from two different mating types. So they have two. Uh, the, the the hyphae come together and they or the the two um, organisms come together and produce a new organism, as it were. So these are haploid producing diploid organisms. Now they yield a dikaryon, which is two nuclei. Nuclei, nuclei fuse, they undergo meiosis, and they form haploid spores. These spores are half of the genetic material. These may be produced by mitosis or budding, if you hear see that term, and the molds may be reproduced by fragmentation. That means it just breaks off um, from the mold. It's not quite like budding. Now, the economic importance of fungi, and they are part of our antibacterial medicines. For example, penicillin is a fungi, greasial fulvin is a fungi. Uh, penicillin you know about, greasial fulvin is used to, to treat uh, fungal infections, strangely enough. Useful tools for studying of, uh, eukaryotic cells. The yeast genetically, or to be genetically easier to produce important molecules including human insulin, hepatitis B vaccine and such, and uh, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisia is brewers or bakers yeast that's used in production of wine, beer, and bread. Other species can be used in cheese making. Also, the greatest spoilers of food. Tons of food are discarded annually because of this fungi. Now, crop diseases impose billions of dollars in costs. So fungi is pretty destructive uh, on the one side, but can be very preservative on the other. Medical importance of fungi, relatively few species actually infect humans, but may produce important antimicrobials. The, the, the net impact of all the fungi is probably po more positive than negative. Some common uh, uh, infections include athlete's foot, uh, jock itch, uh, serious diseases, for example, cryptococcal meningitis. Uh, and, and they can really be, effect, be important or be serious in immunocompromised patients, patients who uh, are on uh, immune suppressing uh, uh, medications because they've had a, a transplant or HIV positive patients and on those kind of patients, the patients that basically don't have a, a fully, fully operating immune system. Now, human diseases occur in three roots. It can, learn, it can occur through allergic reaction. The fungus will grow in, on or in the body, causing mycosis, which is the disease. Or the fungus produces toxins, which affect the, the host. Now, I'm sorry, let's go back here a bit. I'm sorry, which is best. Here's a list of the diseases, the causative agent. And there's a, I, I'm not going to actually say, I'll say what's the causative agent, yada, 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 but I want you to, um, want you to kind of get a look at this so you get an idea of of what those causes of agents are and what, they, what, what diseases they cause. The medical reports of fungi continue. The, the fungal spores are everywhere. They can be up to altitudes of seven miles, and the, where the air contains, uh, can, and the air can contain up to 10,000 cells per cubic millimeter. Fungal spores can trigger an asthma attack. Mycosis is often named after the cause of agent, like Candida albicans and its Candidiasis. They may refer to the affected body part, like cutaneous mycosis of skin invading molds, is called a dermatophytes. Toxins include uh, aflatoxins produced, aspergillus, uh, produced by aspergillus species, are found in grains, peanuts, and uh, course, it's a carcinogenic genetic, uh, organism. So these aflatoxins can actually produce ca cancer in some people. The rye mold, uh, Clavicips uh, uh, purpurea ergot, ergot, produces a hallucinogenic toxin, and it just purifies the drug, drug ergotamine. So this uh, C. purpurea, if you will, produces that hallucinogenic. Some produce toxins that are fatal uh, to the liver, so they can actually uh, kill your liver. That can be very important. Now, we look at algae, which are different than the fungi. They're simple photogenic, or I'll say photogenic. <laughs> yeah, they take pictures very well. Uh, they're photosynthetic eukaryotes, and, are, and sometimes they're called proteins. They differ from plants by the lack of organized vascular system. They have a simple reproductive structure, and there's different types. You have green algae, brown algae, red algae. Um, uh, diatoms, uh, which are uh, the golden brown algae, and the dinoflagellates and euclidians, if you will. 
And so these are different versions of this algae. Algae are diverse groups of proteins. Most are aquatic, which means they live in the water. Other organisms depend on them for food. They can be microscopic or macroscopic, meaning you can't, they may be na uh, invisible to the naked eye, or they may be visible to the naked eye, depending on what you want to talk about. They can be unicellular or multicellular. They all contain chloroplasts and chlorophyll, and they mean other pigments, so they are definitely photosynthetic. The rigid walls are mostly cellulose, so not chitin and not protoglycan. Uh, glycan. The red algae also have an auger uh, within their, their cell walls. The brown algae have an algae, what's called algenic acid. They're not a unified group. They appear along evolutionary continuums based on ribosomal RNA sequences. So we, are, we sort of reorganize them uh, based on our ability to analyze uh, RNA, uh, this ribosomal RNAs. Now, microscopic algae are single cell propelled by flagella or free floating uh, or growth in long chains or filaments. They can be in any of those three versions. Unicellular allergy include diatoms, some green algae, the dinoflagellates, the clinians, or the few uh, red algae. And some, for example, like bullwax, form colonies of 500 or 60,000, up to 500 or 660,000 uh, biflagellated cells. The diatoms incorporate silicon dioxide in the cell walls and deposit their mines for the di uh, diamaceous uh, earth, if you will. So we use them in, our, in, in uh, some of our uh, industry. Now, macroscopic algae include multicellular brown algae, green algae, and red algae. And this is a, these are pictures of each of those, brown, green, and red. The stalk or stipe usually has attached leaf-like structures. And the blades are the main site for photosynthesis. So you get an idea of the macroscopic algae. Now, algal habits, um, if they tend to live in fresh and salt water or moist soil. So the major producers of oxygen and the major consumers of CO2, so they have a great value to us as humans. The algae with different pigments live in different depths based on their photosynthetic capabilities. Now, plankton, they float near the surface. Unicellular algae com uh, compromise a significant portion of what's called the phy uh, phytoplankton, and they form the basis of the food chain. Microscopic heterotrophs in uh, zooplankton graze upon uh, phy uh, phytoplankton and both become food for other organisms. Now, algal reproduction is varied. It can be asexual by fragmentation. And alteration between haploid and diploid generation, and the generations may look similar or different based on, on this alteration from one step to the other. The medical importance of algae, they don't directly cause human disease, but they indirectly do, uh, do affect humans because they can cause toxins. For instance, algal blooms from upwelling of nutrients in warmer temperatures, fertilizer runoff, or untreated sewage. Algal blooms of a dinoflagellus can read the red ties we talk about in the oceans. The uh, gonial lacs produce uh, neurotoxins, uh, saxitoxin, and uh, gonial autoxin, which is among the most potent non-protein poisons known to man. Shellfish feed upon this gonial uh, oxalax, which uh, without harm, which but accumulate that neurotoxic tissue. Humans can consuming can suffer paralytic or shell, shellfish poisoning. Uh, cooking does not destroy this, by the way. So it's something to really be really be aware of uh, when you're eating shellfish or uh, food uh, fish. Uh, shellfish from the ocean. Now, protozoa is the next group we're going to look at, which is, means animal life. And this is a nice little um, configuration to show you their, their, the, the tree, if you will, the, that we talked about. has little meaning in terms of evolutionary relatedness. They are unicellular heterotrophic organisms that are not fungi, slime molds, or water molds. Like algae, slime molds, and water molds, protozoa are protists. Now, they're not a unified group. They appear along this, evol this evolutionary continuum we talk about here. Uh, based upon their RNA, uh, ribosomal RNA sequences. And they're historically classified primarily by means of locomotion. DNA sequences indicate otherwise. So there's two different versions. They classified by how they move or if they move and whether they have their DNA sequencing. So it's really difficult to, their, their, their taxonomy is different depending on what you read. The types of protozoa, they have great diversity. Some cause human disease. Apical complexins is, are parasites with apical complex at one end, help penetrate the membrane of host cells. Many have complex life cycles, and they alternate between sexual and asexual forms. Plasmodium, which is the cause of malaria, there's several types of plasmodium. Um, uh, plas or, uh, malaria, excuse me. Uh, one of the most significant infectious diseases in the world. Also, Toxoplasma gondii, uh, Cryptosporidium uh, parvum, and uh, Cyclospora uh, cytoeniosis. So these are different groups of different, different uh, parts of the protozoa that can, are harmful to humans. The diplomonads and the paramaciliads, 
are flagellated proteins which lack mitochondria, they reproduce asexually. The diplomonads typically have two nuclei. They reside in stagnant water, low in oxygen, or in anaerobic conditions inside the host. Giardia lamblia, which is one of the diplomonads, causes diarrhea and campers. And the pair of bacillids uh, live within the host, for example, in termites, uh, digest cellulose for host. Others can cause uh, disease, for example, trichomonas vaginalis. Uh, hydrogenosium uh, produces some ATP while generating hydrogen, and few parabacillulids uh, also produce asexually. Now, canaloplastids uh, have at least one flagellum, and the distinctive complex mass of DNA in their large single mitochondrium uh, made uh, of interlocking rings. Leishmania, which causes leishmaniasis, which is diseases transmitted by sand fleas, um, is, one of, is one of these groups. Tryptopanzoma, uh, a tryptopanzoma, I'm sorry, I said that earlier. Tryptopanzoma, I'll get it eventually. A cruzi, which causes Chagas disease, and Tryptopanzoma brucei, which has caused African sleeping sickness disease. And so these are different, uh, different versions of the pro, uh, pro, uh, protozoa. <coughs> Lobosians and hetero, uh, heterolobosians, uh, they're amyloid, which means they're flexible, they can move like an amoeba, they kind of move along like a, like a little oozing along, if you will. And the body form but only just related to one another. <coughs> Lobosians extend and retract pseudopodia to move. They engulf the food particles by phagocytosis. Eating viva histolytica causes diarrhea in humans also, so it's one of these groups. Heterolobosians uh, are amyloid, amoeboid, if you will, <coughs> excuse me, also form flagellated cells. Uh, Nagleria phalari swims in water, assumes amoeboid form upon entering the human body, and it eats the host brain. So these are, uh, these are diseases that can really affect humans. Structure protozoa, they have no chloroplasts, um, so they, do not, uh, they are not uh, photosynthetic. They have no cellulose or chitin in the walls. The foraminifera uh, secret, secrete this hard calcium shell, which accumulates to form a limestone deposits, like the white cliffs of Dover in England. Traditionally grouped by method of locomotion, cilia, flagella, or pseudopodia, but they've been reorganized or being reorganized uh, based on uh, based on that uh, RNA configuration. Now, if we look at protozoan habitats. Majority are free living uh, in aquatic organisms. They essentially are decomposers in many ecosystems, and some are parasitic. Zooplankton in marine environments is an important group, and it's abundant in soil or on plants and animals, and they eat large numbers of bacteria and algae. So they, they have a beneficial effect also. Now, they may have complex life cycles and reproductive, reproductive uh, cycles. So more than one habitat or host. Their polymorphic protozoan can exist as a trophozoite, which is the vegetative feeding form of this organism, or a cyst, which is the resting form or the, or the one that, is, uh, that lives in the more uh, d difficult environments. Environmental conditions can trigger the cyst formation, like I said. And lack of nutrients, moisture, oxygen, low temperature chemicals can uh, cause that to happen. Some develop the cell wall, which helps protect the host during transfer from stomach acids, like cryptosporidium into amoeba. They are asexual and sexual reproduction are both common, so they do both. And they have binary fission, which is also called schizgonia, which is multiple fission. And that's basically where one, one of their organisms will, uh, will, it dies in the process, but it produces multiple offspring, and then the cell explodes, and the offspring are released. So it's just going in, if you will, that was that technique. Now, the medical importance of protozoa, the majority do not cause disease, but protozoan pathogens have significant global health impact. There are 209 million that suffer from malaria each year, That's, and there's about 660,000 deaths a year from malaria. It's an interesting phenomenon that malaria could be solved by spending $10 on a person in the African continent, and that would be to buy them a mosquito net. Well, uh, most mosquitoes that carry malaria uh, do, do their biting at night, and so if the people had a, a mosquito net, they would minimize the, the contact with mosquitoes, strangely enough. Not chemicals, not, not technology, just a simple mosquito net. Now, amoebiasis is amoebic dysentery. It affects about 50 million people a year, kills about 100,000 people. Cryptosporidium, a giardia among the leading causes of diarrhea in the world, and trypanosomes cause that sleeping sickness. They've made some regions of Africa uninhabitable for centuries based on, on that infection. So there's a look at all those we talked about. Now we're going to look at slime molds and water molds. Proteins that were once considered types of fungi are now considered slime molds or water molds. They may look and act like fungi, but at cellular and molecular levels are completely unrelated. 
Fungi and water molds are good examples of convergent evolution. They're independent development of similar characteristics. Slime molds, the organisms composed of amoeboid cells that live in soil, leaf litter, if you will, and decaying vegetation. They ingest organic uh, matter by phagocytosis. And they're an important link in the food chain. They ingest microorganisms and they serve as food that, that's, and they serve as food for larger predators. So they fit nicely into the into the food chain. There are two types of slime molds, cellular and plasmodial. The slime molds, the cellular slime molds, their vegetative form is a single amoeba-like cell. When food run, runs out, the cells aggregate to a slug, the term, the term is a slug. And you'll see this, the spores, and then finally diploid, and then we do the ruling body and on forward. Um, some cells form fruiting body, other spores, um, uh, dictyostelium, uh, visco Idium is a, mo uh, is a model organism, uh, if you will, for that. You can see this the effect of we have the, we have the um, fruiting uh, bodies, which release the spores. Uh, they are haploid, and they, they combine. They form diploid cells. Diploid cells produce the plasmodium, produce the fruiting body, and we start all over again. So that's this process, if you will, of, of a sexual process, sexual and sexual. Now, plasmodium slime molds. They are large multinucleated super amoebas, they're called, because they can, they can reach a size of 0.5 meters in diameter, uh, which is kind of interesting. They're widespread, really visible, often brightly colored. They follow germination of haploid spores. That should be millimeters. That's weird. It should be 0.5 millimeters, which is still visual, by the way. Um, they follow germination of haploid spores. Cells, the cells fuse. They form diploid cells. The nucleus divides repeatedly to form multinucleated stages called plasmodium. So this what you're seeing here is that the sexual reproduction of haploid cells which fuse and then the nucleus and then, a, then an asexual process which goes into plasmodium. Plasmodium oozes over decaying wood and leaves, ingests organic debris and microorganisms. In the stages of food, uh, water, stimul water stimulates the formation of spore forming, uh, um, uh, the shortage of food, I'm sorry, water stim stimulates the formation of these spore forming fruity bodies. So the, when this food is, food is uh, at a minimum, a water, water, if you will, added can stimulate that spore-forming fruiting body to cause the cause to create more spores to go elsewhere. Now, water molds are oomycetes, and they form massive white threads or decaying material, and they secrete digestive enzymes onto the substrate, the thing they're trying to break down. Cytoplasm and filaments is continuous with many nuclei, but cellulose in cell walls, uh, their cellulose in the wall is not chitin. They lack chloroplasts, so they're not they don't uh, they don't they're not uh, uh, photosynthetic, and the reproductive cells are flagellated. Their important their important food crop disease include downy mildew of grapes and potato blight. So they play an important negative role in uh, our environment. Multicellular parasites include the helmets. Helmets are include nematodes, which are roundworms, cestodes, which are tapeworms, and trematodes, which are flukes. Now they invade the host tissue, and they they are very uh, they are very invasive and very uh, very uh, cause a very big greedy effect for the humans because they they basically compete for the nutrients that the human takes in. They're largely controlled in industrialized nations. They affect hundreds of millions in developing worlds. It's interesting that I tell you this kind of historical story. At one time in the 1800s, there was a company that um, had a medicine that would help women lose weight. And they would take these these pills, these capsules, and they would lose the weight. Uh, what those what those capsules contained were the eggs of a cesto, the tapeworm. So they caused people to have tapeworms, and they would lose the weight. Um, sometimes they kill them, but they lose the weight. And so that we 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 have um, lived kind of this interesting um, relationship with uh, with these helmets for a long time. The very roots of entry of the body include hookworm larvae, which live in the soil and burrow through the skin and the feet. We have uh, a multiplying digestive tract. They're excreted with feces. Poor sanitation, bare feet, eating transmission. And about 740 million individuals can become infected. The nematode, which is called Trichinella spiralis, is ingested by animal in animal flesh, especially under pork. So trichinomas, trichinomas, trichomonas, excuse me, is a disease that causes. <coughs> Pitworms, uh, Enterobius vermicularis, is ingested in the food, and then it grows inside the, the, the uh, uh, intestinal tract. Now, nematode, the Wachiria van, van Crofty, which causes elephantitis, is transmitted by mosquitoes. They lodge in the lymphatic vessels and they block them, which causes the, the, uh, the appendage to swell. The nematode, uh, Ococircia vulva, uh, volvulus, spread by flies, causes river blindness, and at least 1,800 million, 1800 million, 18 million are infected. About 270,000 are completely blind at some point in time, and 500,000 are impaired. Results from 
inflammatory uh, uh, response to bacteria. And the bacterium uh, will bacteria uh, pigmentus is carried by the nematodes, so they can also get a secondary infection. Now, helpless may have a complex life cycle with more, more than one uh, intermediate host. For instance, snails are intermediate hosts for the fluke of schistosoma. The benzoni causes schistomyiasis. And the reproduction takes place in the humans, the definitive host. Humans may become dead end hosts if infected by parasites that competes life cycle for another host, for instance, swimmer's age caused by uh, water flukes. Here's a list of the different kinds of uh, uh, nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes, the diseases they cause, and the characteristics of diseases. And it's a good thing to look at as you move forward. Now, roundworms, nematodes, are cylindrically shaped body. They look like, look like large nightcrawlers in some cases. The logistic tract extends to the mouth, the anus, uh, carrying inhabitants, Elegans is a model eukaryotic organism. Many nematodes are free living in soil and water, and some are parasites. 30,000 nematode species have been identified. There may be over a million. Ascaris leverchoides causes ascariasis, the most common roundworms disease. I'll tell you a little story. I was in Honduras many, many, many years ago and with the Air Force, and um, we were on a mission, but when we weren't doing our mission, we would uh, do uh, humanitarian uh, care for the local population at that time. And I was listening to a little boy at bad pneumonia. And I was listening to him, and as I listened to him, uh, a scarce little coitus, which is a worm about oh, 10, 12 inches long, uh, started coming out of his nose. And so, so I knew right away that his pneumonia was caused by, by other than uh, a regular, regular bacteria, but could have been that too, but a scarce little coitus. The, the population of Honduras at that time was probably 90% infected with some sort of parasite. Now, females may re reach a 45 centimeters in length. It's interesting, 45 centimeters. So 2.54 centimeters is an inch. So you can imagine this is about, oh, 20, about 20 inches long. And they can release about 200,000 eggs per day in the intestinal tract. So they're pretty aggressive, uh, pretty aggressive organisms. This talks about the roundward nematodes. The worm uh, eggs are contaminated, solar ingested, and basically it's fecal oral. If you want to know how that works, it's a feces of some organism that had these had this disease, and then it's eaten by humans. And then it's uh, the ingested eggs hatch, and the larvae penetrate the internal intestinal uh, capillaries that are carried to the lungs. The larvae enter the lungs from capillaries and can then be coughed up or swallowed. I.e., how I found that uh, that uh, the, the organism that came out that, that little boy's nose. And then the, in the intestine, the mature larvae develop into adult worms. The eggs are released from the adult worms and are passed on the feces, and then continues that cycle. Now, tapeworms or cestodes are flat, ribbon-shaped bodies, and they may exceed one, one meter in length. They can be quite large. They have no digestive system, but they absorb nutrients through their body, so they compete with the nutrients of their host. The head end, the scolex, which as you see right here, has the hooks in it, uh, attach to the intestine of the host and segments and so these have these segments that grow out behind it, these little segments called the, uh, uh, called the progodids. They contain male and female structures. The progodids farthest from the scolex contain the eggs, and they break off and eliminate the feces along with the eggs, and they're, again, uh, ingested by the next host. Flukes, or trematodes, are flat and leaf-shaped. They have suckers that hold them in place while sucking fluids from the host. Blood flukes are the most common cause of schistomoniasis and result in 20,000 deaths a year. The females lay eggs in the blood vessels during the intestine. The inflammatory reaction causes rupture in the blood vessels. The eggs are then released to the intestine and excreted with the feces. The larvae develop in water and are taken up by the snail host. And following age sexual reproduction of the snail, the tail bearing larvae are released and can penetrate, can penetrate the skin of humans, uh, a human host, which is wading in the water and enter the blood vessels. So they're pretty aggressive. The, we have arthropods that are insects and arachnids. They serve as vectors of transmission. We have different kinds of mechanicals that transfer pathogens from one surface to another, so they're mechanical. And biological is an essential part of life cycle. For example, Plasmodium or Anopheles mosquito can move the trypanosomes in, in the TC fly. So we see the difference. Uh, we see the difference here with the, the Plasmodium, which causes malaria, and Anopheles mosquito, the trypanosomes, uh, and which causes the trypanosomiasis in the, for the TC fly. So they can be mechanical or biological. And animals may act as a reservoir. For example, rats can be a, can be a reservoir for many different bacteria and, and uh, parasites. The incidence can be decreased by controlling vectors or hosts. For example, the plague in the US 
is controlled mostly by eliminating rat populations, which uh, are carrying your city of pestis. So that's the, the plague we're talking about here. These are some of the arthropods, if you will. There's the insects that are involved, infectious agents, the disease characteristics. You take a look at that. And I won't go through them, if you will. So arthropods uh, that we talk about are mosquitoes. They insert their feeding tube through the skin, the host's skin. They ingest blood. They can pick up infective agents. They transfer to subsequent hosts. Malaria, yellow fever, and dengue fever, West Nile encephalitis are all transmitted by mosquitoes. Different kinds of mosquitoes, by the way. Um, it's interesting enough. So, but they are they are all mosquito mosquitoes. Fleas are wingless insects. We can jump from 30 30 centimeters. So think about that. That's about, that's about uh, 20 uh, inches. Usually a nuisance, but can transmit some pathogens. Cause of agent of plague that your city is pestis. But please pick up uh, when biting a defective host, the bacteria multiplies and blocks the digestive tract. The starving fleas bite repeatedly because they're hungry and they pass the bacteria onto the host. <coughs> Excuse me. Fleas can live in a vacant building or, which are dormant for months and they mature quickly and jump to, great, uh, to greet new hosts. So they are pretty aggressive. Lice, they're small wingless insects. Uh, they suck blood through the skin. They have appendages which are adapted for that attachment. The uh, pediculus humanus is easily spread by direct contact or contact with personal items. Survives only a few days away from the host. The body lice can transmit bacterial diseases like trench fever, uh, Bartolona quintana, epi uh, epidemic typhus with rickettsia uh, proazisti, and the relapsing fever with Borrelia recurrentis. So head lice do not transmit disease, but they're, they're obviously quite a quite an issue. Ticks are arachnids. They lack wings and antennae. They have four pairs of legs. They have fused thorax and abdomen. They live in uh, low vegetation. They wait for the host passing by. They burrow into the skin with their mouth parts and they mingle on those for days. And they feed continually. So the word tick, the wood tick, uh, Dermatocenter endorosoni, transmits the Rocky Mountain spotted fever or the bacteria, Rickettsia or Rickettsi. Uh, the Exodotes uh, scapularis. Transmits the Lyme disease, the bacterium is Borella, Borella uh, Borgerfri. Saliva to some ticks can produce tick paralysis, especially in children, and recovery follows the removal of the tick. So they can be pretty aggressive and pretty dangerous. Mites are tiny, fast moving arachnids. They live on the outer surfaces of plants and, and animals. Microscopic uh, Dermodex mites have uh, live unnoticed in hair follicles or oil producing glands. Large numbers often live in, uh, indoors and feed on shed skin cells. They don't transmit diseases, but can trigger asthma. Chiggers or mite larvae, which may attach, feed on fluids within the skin cells and cause intense itching. Sarco uh, Sarcoptes uh, scabii, which transmit uh, by personal contact, cause the disease scabies. And what happens is the scabies burrow underneath the skin, and their feces, they lay eggs and they excrete feces, and the eggs and the feces cause an uh, inflammatory reaction, which causes the itching. So we talked about the uh, you, you carry out members of the micro microbial world this particular chapter. Uh, thank you very much.